we have absolutely no problem with peaceful demonstrations against anything under the sun, whether it's myself, my government, a social livelihood issue, lack of affordable housing. But on this uh, particular occasion over the last few months, what we have seen in Hong Kong, which is totally unprecedented and unfamiliar to us, and every one of you who knows Hong Kong and loves Hong Kong, is that high degree of violence. Um, let me just begin by saying the chief executive uh, has a, uh, agreed to do this conversation with no, no preconditions, um, and we will try and make it as frank and interesting as possible. I thought I would begin by Welcome you, Madam Chief Executive, and thanking you for do the, doing this. Thank you very much, uh, Farid. Uh, this session, ladies and gentlemen, is also exceptional for me. First, is, this is my third consecutive time in uh, WEF uh, Davos. The first time I'm giving this honor and privilege to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, although I was not expecting a CNN anchor <laughs> to do it. <laughs> uh, it just makes it more challenging. Uh, the, uh, the second exceptional is uh, I'm sure many of you who uh, have followed events in Hong Kong uh, since June last year, this is perhaps uh, the first overseas uh, media, if I still regard it as a media interview that I have taken. So I, I love to be as candid as possible to tell you something about Hong Kong's latest development. So, so let me start by asking you something that's on people's minds right now, mm -hmm. which is, what can you tell us about the Wuhan virus, what some people are calling the China virus? How rapidly does it seem to spread? How worried should we be? Yeah. Well, since we uh, received notification on the 31st of uh, December last year about this uh, Wuhan, now, of course, uh, we call it this novel uh, corona uh, virus uh, pneumonia. Uh, we have been uh, putting um, ourselves on a very highly uh, vigilant system because we learned from the past. I'm sure you still remember Hong Kong handling the SARS in 2003 and subsequently um, avian flu and swine flu and the MERS uh, virus and so on. So we have built up a pretty robust and vigilant system to put ourselves on the guard. Now, a couple of hours ago, um, Hong Kong health authorities have just announced that we have the first case of highly suspicious uh, infection in Hong Kong um, from a passenger uh, from Wuhan or from Wuhan via another city coming to Hong Kong. So this system, which has been put in place for almost three weeks now, will now be put into actual action. Um, I have asked my health colleagues to be really on the guard because uh, public health is so very important to the community. And with this uh, rapid flow of people across the border, it makes Hong Kong uh, even more vulnerable should this uh, disease spread. So I, I want to assure you that we have a system, we have a protocol, we have the resources, we have the isolation facilities in our public hospitals, as well as in some of the makeshift isolation facilities, making use of holiday camps if quarantine is needed for some of those in close contact with this uh, particular passenger through our very effective uh, contact tracing. But finally, uh, the, the most important point is to keep people informed. So openness and transparency are important features in any public health system. And uh, we have been doing almost daily um, media uh, reports, but uh, from tomorrow onwards, uh, at a um, particular time of the day, uh, my health colleagues will come out to share with the community the latest situation. All right, now to the, uh, to the larger stuff. Um, I saw somewhere that you said you weren't sure uh, what the protesters were still protesting about in Hong Kong, given that you have withdrawn the extradition bill and made clear that it is a dead letter. From my reading of the situation, uh, they are protesting for other things now. Uh, independent police commission, uh, a kind of full democracy that they were protesting for during the umbrella protests. Of course, your resignation. So at this point, it seems as though, you know, there is this irresistible force of the protesters with a lot of public support, and there is the immovable object of Carrie Lam. What is going to happen? Well, let me first uh, put this in the Hong Kong context. We are very used to protests and demonstrations. 
On an annual basis, uh, the police has to handle over 10,000 such events, whether they are public assemblies, protests, marches, or what we call the POEs, the public order events. Uh, we have absolutely no problem with peaceful demonstrations against anything under the sun, whether it's myself, my government, a social livelihood issue, lack of affordable housing. But on this uh, particular occasion over the last few months, what we have seen in Hong Kong, which is totally unprecedented and unfamiliar to us, and every one of you who knows Hong Kong and loves Hong Kong, is that high degree of violence that total disrespect for differences in opinion, that people were beaten uh, when they hold a different opinion from some of these uh, protesters or rioters. So to simplify all these protests as just um, fighting for democracy and uh, for continued freedoms may have underestimated the situation. So similarly for the government to provide a political response because the protesters or these rioters wanted to see a particular response will not be a very prudent way of ensuring Hong Kong's future and public interest. So every political demand has to be fully assessed against several important principles. One, whether it goes against this very important principle of one country, two systems. That is important to ensure Hong Kong's continued stability and prosperity and also whether it will continue to enable us to preserve the rights and freedoms enjoyed by everyone in Hong Kong, not just the protesters and rioters. What about the bystanders? What about the families of policemen who have been intimidated and harassed throughout these months? Another principle is the rule of law. To demand the chief executive to ask the secretary for justice to grant an overall amnesty to everyone arrested over the last few months is totally inconceivable in the context of a rule of law, which we hold so dearly in Hong Kong. And finally, I could not agree to demands that simply will destroy Hong Kong's well-founded institutions, whether it is the judiciary, the law enforcement agencies, the Mass Transit Railway Corporation, which uh, is represented in my delegation, the airport authority, and even the freedom of the press. Uh, while the media may be very unhappy with some of the things that the policemen have done during the course of operations amidst very difficult circumstances, with over 10,000 petrol bombs thrown at them or seized from university campuses, and uh, policemen being injured with corrosive liquid, and the uh, arrow being uh, intruded into the lake of uh, a, a plainclothes uh, policeman. So against those odds, if the media is unhappy that they have been treated not as decently as they would like to see, we will improve it. The police has promised that they will improve it through their public relations officer. But it is very important to ensure that the media is as free, as liberal as possible to report on these events. So despite pressure, I can tell you, Farid, this, I, I, have, I face a lot of pressure, not from the protesters, from the anti-protest camp that I should control the journalists. I should make sure that everybody comes to my office or the police office for an identification document before they could go down to the site to report. I'd rather not, because that would destroy or undermine one of the institutional <coughs> strengths in Hong Kong, that is the freedom of the media. But if one views it just from this very um, technical uh, point of view, it seems to me it misses this larger uh, upsurge that seems to be happening in Hong Kong. I saw written across Central Square, uh, you taught us during the umbrella movement that peaceful protests don't work. This seems to harken back to that, and it is about this fundamental issue of will Hong Kong have what the protesters regard as genuine democracy. It seems that they have an enormous amount of public support. Between, you know, if you look at the mass rallies, if you look at public opinion polls, and if you look at the most recent elections, right, where 17 out of 18 uh, of, the, of the constituencies flipped. Doesn't that tell you that this is something larger and that it has to be dealt with in a more, in a more fundamental way, that people in Hong Kong are scared that what makes the city special is going to go away? No. What makes the city special will not go away. Those rights and freedoms enshrined under the basic law, under one country, two systems, will be fiercely safeguarded, not only by myself and my government, 
but also by the central government. Time and again, the leaders have said that they want Hong Kong to succeed under one country, two systems, because that is such an innovative way that we're devised to solve a historical problem in Hong Kong and to ensure Hong Kong's stability. But I would agree with you that uh, in a free society like Hong Kong, there is something missing, and that is, in your terminology, the genuine democracy. In my terminology, that is democracy that is with within the constitutional framework, because Hong Kong is not a state. Hong Kong is a special administrative region within the People's Republic of China. We have a basic law that on the one hand given, gives us the freedoms, the independence of judiciary. On the other hand, it has certain safeguards in, to make sure that the constitutional development is something that is acceptable within you, that contest. You mentioned that you think that these freedoms will be guaranteed by the, the, the central government in Beijing. Can you, on, your, on the basis of your conversations with them, say that it, it, they have categorically ruled out a Tiananmen Square-style crackdown in Hong Kong? Well, while people focus on what has happened, I'm sure you watched the TV and got your own images and video clips, which I would uh, suggest that you perhaps need to look at the other side of the uh, reporting. While people focus on what has happened in Hong Kong, I would tell you something that has not happened in Hong Kong in the last seven months. There's a massive bloodshed, bloodshed on Hong Kong streets that some wanted to see has not happened in Hong Kong. The presence of the People's Liberation Army, the strips on Hong Kong streets, has not happened in Hong Kong, except on one occasion when the garrison came out to do voluntary work to clear the blockage on the roads. A curfew has not happened in Hong Kong. I have that authority to declare curfew to stop people's uh, freedom of movements and going to offices has not happened in Hong Kong. And will you but say the, the gagging PLA of the media, which some are wearing, has not happened That's passed. You Kong. guarantee it won't happen yeah. in the future? As I said, if everybody is committed to one country, two systems, like uh, what the central government has, then one country, two systems means all these freedoms and rights enshrined in a basic law. What do you think people in Hong Kong don't understand about the central government in Beijing? I wouldn't say everybody don't understand. Hong Kong is a very open, free, and diverse society. I think um, although we have been reunified with, um, uh, with the mainland of China for 20, almost 23 years, there's accurate understanding of one country, two systems, and the full implementation of one country, two systems um, has room for improvement. For example, uh, if one saw scenes of young people waving the American flags, the, uh, the UK flags, and seeing young people forming themselves into uh, parties to advocate independence of Hong Kong. You could not say that they understand one country, two systems. If we have uh, the pan-democratic legislators telling people that a piece of legislation called the National Anthem Act is a piece of evil legislation. That is not understanding of one country, two systems. If we have young girls, 15 age, defaced the national flag and threw it into the Victoria Harbor, that could not be a, a, a true understanding of one country, two systems. Yeah? There is good reporting that suggests, and you can confirm, that you were not ordered by Beijing to propose the, the treaty that is at the source of all that. I'm sorry. Um, there's good reporting that um, Beijing did not force you to put uh, the law that is at the, at the heart of all these protests that has now been withdrawn, mm -hmm. the extradition law, that it was your idea. I'm wondering, um, what were you thinking? Because it, it, was it an attempt to show Beijing that you were more loyal, uh, you were loyal to them, what, what, what was, why did you do it? Well, first of all, I can confirm well, what you have just mentioned, as I did on several occasions. Uh, this piece of legislative uh, proposal was um, initiated by the Hong Kong ASEAN government. Well, of course, not by myself. I got a team of uh, security colleagues and um, justice colleagues who have looked into the situation. 
So, uh, but uh, once we have uh, suggested, since it will touch on the mainland uh, arrangements, uh, we have the support of the central government all the way in processing this piece of legislation because uh, towards the latter stage, people said that, okay, if you want to do surrender of fugitive offenders to other parts of the world as well as to mainland, we need more human rights safeguards. So we asked the central government whether we, should, we could put into uh, the law more safeguards along the lines of the I ICCPR, and they said yes. So this is what I said that we initiated, the central government understood and supported us in doing so. Now, coming to your question, why did we do it? Um, we are a very conscientious bunch of uh, officials. There are certain inadequacies in our legal regime when it comes to the surrender of fugitive offenders or when it comes to mutual legal assistance on criminal matters. As far as the latter, there is a geographical limitation that Hong Kong could not have any thing to do in terms of providing mutual legal assistance for criminal cases with other parts of China, that is mainland Macau, Taiwan. Absolutely nothing. We couldn't do anything to combat cross-border crime because of that geographical constraint in the, law, in the legislation. On the other hand, for the uh, surrender of fugitive offenders or extradition, the law only allows us realistically to do it with those we have signed an agreement. And we have signed only 20 extradition agreements since um, many, many years ago. But as you know, now uh, international crimes uh, take place all over the world. So we look around into other legal regimes and discover that we do have a system which I believe is based on the UK system to do such extradition on a case-by-case -case basis without the need to sign an agreement. But each case has to be endorsed by the court before the chief executive could sign on a certificate to surrender. And if we believe, and I think we should believe, because there are so many distinguished judges overseas involved in a court of final appeal in Hong Kong, that courts in Hong Kong are independent, then there is sufficient safeguard to assure you that each case of application of surrender of a fugitive offender, we have to go through this independent court, various levels, the high court, the court of final appeal, and so on, before the chief executive could sign on it. So I'm, I'm telling you a bit of the, the background because we are not doing it suddenly because we want to appease somebody. I want to get some credit from somebody. It's because we have all these documented as deficiencies in our system. And it was also challenged by FATAC, the faction, the, the Financial Affairs Task Force of G7 and G20, that that is a very significant deficient in the Hong Kong legal system when it comes to any anti-money laundering because you can't do cross-border <laughs> mutual legal assistance and, and so on. So it is with that background, which is not just happened last year, that background was documented in the government files for a long time. Somebody should, somebody should have that, that uh, sort of due diligence to, to deal with this. But I have to say that uh, everybody knows their sensitivity, so uh, government officials tend to have inertia. So nobody want, wanted to touch this unless this murder case came around. There's a murder case in Taiwan involving two Hong Kong permanent residents. Uh, one killed the other and then fled back to Hong Kong. And the Taiwan authorities originally asked her very solemnly for us to surrender him back to Taiwan for trial. But because of the limitations, we couldn't do it. So in a way prompted by this high profile case, we decided to take up this challenge. <laughs> And, uh, but I would, uh, I would confess that it's now proven to be a political failure, partly because of the nature of the matter and partly because of a very obsolete PR machinery of the Hong Kong SEO government, especially faced with the world-class propaganda uh, to challenge us. Do you think though that, have you learned something about the sensitivities of the Hong Kong people in the way they have responded to this law. That it, again, it seems that the law is a symbol of a fear that their one country's two systems has been slowly eroded by the reach of Beijing's legal administrative intelligence apparatus. Well, I certainly have, um, have learned, I learned a lot. That's why when people asked me to resign, I said, 
can I hang in to practice what I have learned uh, so that we can, I can leave behind a better infrastructure for Hong Kong in dealing with uh, challenges in future years. Uh, I have learned that despite, as I said, uh, 23 years after reunification, uh, we have not helped the people of Hong Kong to better understand this very unique arrangement. We perhaps have not done enough in, na in national education, especially amongst the young people, to have a better understanding of what China is about. Uh, and uh, we have perhaps underestimated the grievances of people, uh, which are not uncommon in other places where we have seen riots in recent years um, of all sorts of things. The, lack of uh, economic opportunities for people with different backgrounds and different skills. Uh, the lack of diversification in our industries is mainly a financial center, a trading hub. It's about the affordability of housing, which uh, I'm sure Hong Kong is almost the worst <laughs> when it comes but to you buying. Know, Madam Chief, yeah. Chief Executive, when I asked the protesters, yeah. and I've had a few on the program, they all say, don't get fooled by all that. Mm. This is about democracy. Well, I, I, did not, I did not deny that. I'm just giving you a fuller picture of what uh, I've learned about the people's sentiments. And uh, I think nobody would deny that this housing problem, this um, gap between the rich and the poor, this concentration of wealth in a uh, certain proportion of a population are all part of that, uh, that problem. Your approval rating is now at 14%. It must be very difficult to operate under those circumstances. You, privately, we know you have ex ruminated about uh, resigning. Why not resign? Well, I, I actually have just answered that question uh, myself. Um, it would be easy, Farid, it would be very easy to just run away or walk away from a situation. And one has to recognize it's quite a messy situation now because as you have said, uh, for a government with uh, very low level of support and credibility, it's very difficult to, to govern and to implement policies because policies are bound to be very controversial in an open and diverse uh, society like Hong Kong. But um, for those who understand the political structure and the position of a chief executive in the Hong Kong SAR, uh, leaving uh, that position vacant will only create more uncertainty and confusion. And uh, Hong Kong now has um, several crises um, to handle, to manage the economic recession, this uh, continued protest and the political discontent, and lately a public health crisis. So I, I do feel that it is that same sense of responsibility that has motivated me three years ago to contest in the chief executive election that has given me that uh, stamina to stay on. Because it's not easy, it's really not easy to stay on. Do you think that Hong Kong will one day have universal adult suffrage, uh, a democracy in which the candidates are not pre-selected uh, by Beijing, but you know what, generally speaking, in the world would be considered a full-fledged liberal democracy? Or is that a pipe dream for the protesters? No, this goes back to the question that Hong Kong is not a state, Hong Kong is not a country. Hong Kong is part of the People's Republic of China. So uh, the political structure the dictates that it has to be within that constitutional contest. And that constitutional contest has laid out very clearly that uh, when we reach the ultimate goal of having the chief executive elected by universal suffrage, it has to be uh, candidates nominated by a broadly representative nominating committee. So unless the basic law was amended, that would be the constitutional basis for any universal suffrage. And every place has its own election system. In America, you could have a candidate who have the largest number of popular votes, but still could not be the president. So that is their system. We have a system that you need a broadly representative nominating committee, 1,200 members, so maybe it could be added to another larger number in future, but it has to be broadly representative. So it's not just representing the interests of the rich people, it's broadly representative. It has a labor unions, it has a Chinese medical practitioners, it has engineers, architects, politicians, and so on. So as to nominate two or three, we were, Farid, we were very close to giving universal suffrage to the people of Hong Kong in 2015. That was vetoed by the same group of 
legislators who said that they want more democracy in Hong Kong. You know that this answer is not going to satisfy the protesters. What is the resolution then? As I say, you have, you have these demands that they are making and they seem, un, they seem unwilling to back down and they have kept, kept at it. And, and you're, you're saying there's really no give on this fundamental issue. How will this end? Well, how will this end will also um, depend on how the majority of Hong Kong people feel about Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong is a wonderful place. I'm sure at least many of the people I, I, I met in the last um, couple of days came up to tell me that uh, they, they have a passion for Hong Kong, they love Hong Kong, they want Hong Kong to be well. Yeah. So if Hong Kong people have that same feeling and do not want to see Hong Kong further deteriorated into that sort of state, not only economically, but also socially, then I think we have a better chance to find or chart a way forward. Of course, I'm not suggesting that the government should do nothing and uh, stand still. Um, we are about to announce the setting up of a review committee, an independent review committee, to look into the causes of this sustained uh, social unrest and to identify all these underlying issues, deep-seated problems, including some of those maybe related to one country, two systems, and map out a way forward. Um, we are continuing to engage with the people. Dialogues have taken place, although we couldn't do it on a televised public way because whoever now associates with the government or speaks with the government will be intimidated and harassed <laughs> by the uh, protesters or the netizens, but we'll continue to do that. And even before I have a review report with recommendations in front of me, we are doing whatever we could in making housing more affordable for the people of Hong Kong, in uh, introducing more livelihood measures, which I did a week ago, uh, to provide a better retirement protection for elderly people and to provide better terms of employment for the non-skilled laborers uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, but I have, I have to, this to assure you, um, finally, that nothing is more important than the rule of law in Hong Kong. The rule of law has to be sound and well because it underpins all the successes and stability that Hong Kong people, as well as the central authority, would like to see. You said you have met three times with Xi Jinping. Yes. Do you believe that, um, that he is committed to maintaining the one country, two systems uh, and letting Hong Kong have this special status that it has? Definitely. Definitely. One is because this is, as you know, Chinese people have um, uh, saying that whatever you promise, this is more than any contract. I got some business people <laughs> here. Is that once you have promised something, you should honor that, regardless of the difficulties, without even the need to sign on a piece of paper. So I, I'm, I, I have received very clear messages from President Xi himself from other um, central uh, leaders that one country, two systems is almost sacrosanct. But of course, as I have put down a qualifier, it has to be accurately understood and fully implemented. Um, in other words, not at will or arbitrarily uh, implemented. Second thing is Hong Kong is still a valuable asset to, to China. It is, a, is a, it's a wonderful gateway between the mainland um, of China as well as the rest of the world. It is still a wonderful financial center for a lot of um, uh, Chinese enterprises to go out. Half of the companies listed on the stock exchange are mainland companies, accounting for 70% of the market capitalization. We are providing funds, uh, offshore RMB, and um, a lot of other things which will contribute to the continuous opening up and reform of the Chinese economy. So don't, don't, don't take for granted the value of Hong Kong uh, to the People's Republic of China. You've alluded in uh, some of your comments to the idea that there might be some outside forces that are in, involved in uh, organizing or supporting the protests in Hong Kong. As you know, no independent reporting suggests that the United States or uh, Great Britain is in any way involved in this. Do you want to clarify what you meant by that? Well, uh, I can only say that, oh, first of all, I, I, I never sort of uh, uh, point finger at any outside parties that they were a party to what we have seen in Hong Kong. But the facts um, are telling 
from the day we started this exercise to um, contemplate this bill, there have been a lot of uh, interest from America, from uh, politicians to officials and, and so on. Uh, I have seen uh, many occasions of my uh, uh, sort of anti-government uh, legislators going to America uh, to plead for their intervention into Hong Kong affairs. I have seen uh, many young people who have uh, asked uh, foreign governments to sanction uh, the Hong Kong ASEAN government and senior officials. And, uh, but that doesn't mean the government has done that. Anyone yeah. can petition. That's why I'm not drawing conclusive uh, uh, decision out of that. I'm just telling, shelling with you that something that should be quite domestic uh, in Hong Kong has attracted a lot of um, external uh, attention and association with the protesters and the parties who have been arranging all these uh, uh, activities. Finally, if you had, um, let me ask it this way. If you could talk to the protesters, if they were listening to you right now, what is it you want to say to them? Treasure Hong Kong. We can sit down and talk, but please treasure Hong Kong. Don't destroy Hong Kong. Do you think that Hong Kong can be preserved beyond 2047, the point at which one country, two systems expires? Uh, before I answer your question, I clarify. When you said protesters, I have nothing, uh, I have no difficulty with the peaceful protesters, as I mentioned. What I said about don't destroy Hong Kong is really the violent protesters, and I'm sure we're all shocked by the degree of violence that we have seen. Now, 2047, people refer to this as uh, the D-Day or the deadline. That need not be so, because in the basic law, it only refers to 50 years unchanged as far as the capitalist system and the, um, the way of uh, living in Hong Kong. So my proposition is if one country, two systems works well to the um, uh, satisfaction of um, the central authorities and the Hong Kong people meeting the, the wishes um, in the basic law, which is Hong Kong is an inseparable part of the People's Republic of China, then you have to ask, why should we change it? Yeah. So with that, I hope that uh, it will go on well. Forever. <laughs> Carrie Lam, mm -hmm. pleasure to have you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.